So I have my wife here, Dawn. We're glad to be here. And my brother, John, joined us today. And Trina and their son, Tyler. And um, this is the, it's a little, I was thinking as I was sitting here, because, you know, I've been visiting this church for a long time. And it's the first time I've visited since COVID. And during, at the very front of COVID, my, both my parents passed away. So the last time I was here, my parents were, you know, here in the crowd watching us and, in a sense, cheering me on, I guess. And uh, just on uh, this last Thursday, uh, May 26th, my, was the two-year anniversary of when my dad moved to heaven, and then my mom on March 19th. And so Don and I were able to go out to the um, cemetery. And one of the things that we've done to honor our parents, and of course, I think most of you know, but maybe not all of you, that our daughter also passed away, moved to heaven five and a half years ago. And we are involved in church planting, starting churches, and we do that in different ways in Mexico and in Cuba. And one of the things that we've done is we sometimes will raise money and build churches, and that helps kick off a church plant. Sometimes they already have a core group, and other times they're kind of starting from scratch. So we built a church in our daughter's memory in Mexicali about four years ago in 2018. Actually, my dad went with us. If you've ever been to Mexicali, that's a hot place. It's like Phoenix. And so that was, I remember I was in Cuba, and I came back, and my dad was all anxious, and he was telling me he wanted to go, and I hadn't invited him. I didn't think, I mean, he was in his early 80s, I think, and I didn't think he'd want to go, and he was wondering about the, having a passport to go. And But anyway, he ended up joining us, and, and uh, that was very special. And then last summer, we raised some money, and we built a church in honor of my parents, Ron and Virginia Diazzo in Rosarito, which is just right next to Tijuana. And then now, we're just now starting a new church, another church that we're building in Mexicali. We're about halfway through because we haven't gotten all the money yet. To, or we need still about $6,000 to finish it up. But the pastor there, I'll share just briefly, just to give you a little uh, insight to some of the churches and some of the types of pastors we work with. We work with all kinds of pastors, but some of them come from very broken backgrounds. And this particular guy in in Mexicali that were helping start a new church. He was enslaved in drugs for many years. Had a, he, people in his neighborhood didn't like him because he caused a lot of trouble there. And um, he ended up getting shot um, by, three times. And he was because of the drug, he, he was on crystal, and I don't know if they got mad at him or what, but he got shot three times. He ended up in the hospital and he wasn't a Christian at this time, and he was close to death. He was in the hospital for 50 days, three days in a coma, and they took his mom outside the room and told his mom, we've done everything we can do. He, he's, there's nothing more we can do. You know, he's going to die. And, and I think it was right when they were telling her that, that he cried out, Madre, you know, Mom, and, and they ran in. She said, the mom, I met her recently, she said that the doctors ran in, the medical staff ran in, and they all got on their knees and said it was a miracle. And, and that pastor was separated from his wife. His wife was living in another part of Mexico, and they had a, they had a daughter together that was with the wife. Her name's Lucy. And she found her dad on Facebook and said, I want to you know, go see my dad. And they, they did that. They moved back to Mexicali. And now their marriage has been restored. And um, uh, Jorge is starting this church. He, he came to Christ through a Christian drug rehab. And he got very involved in that. And that's what, part of what he wants to do. He wants to you know, reach people for Christ. And a lot of the people in his church are people that have been addicted to drugs. And, um, so, and he would like to have a, a, a nut, start a rehab out of his church. So it's exciting. It's a very, I mean, the, uh, the place they live, Don and I have been there. Some of these people 
like I said, we have a variety of types of people we work with because we do work with professional people as well, but they have a dirt floor for their kitchen. Uh, just one room as far as their bedroom goes, their, their, their bathroom is a modified outhouse type thing. And, but they're very happy to be there serving the Lord. It's super hot. They don't have air conditioning. They have some fans. But they're faithfully serving the Lord. And it's just, I mean, it's humbling for me to see the way that some of these people sur suffer and sacrifice to serve the Lord. And so that's, that's our more, most recent church plant. And I'm going to share a little bit more about some of that when I get into our, the sermon and we're also, some of you may know, we're also working in Cuba. And Cuba's like, I like to call it a tale of two cities because on the one hand, there's just so much suffering there. I mean, if anybody has any inclinations towards communism, they should go visit Cuba and just see what the people live like. Like, my, the Cubans have a very good sense of humor and they like to say, that yes, we all have the same, the same misery, the same suffering. And, and it is true, and you see them, you know, they have very little, and it's gotten worse. They didn't have much before COVID, and it's gotten worse since then. You know, they live off of rice and beans. Uh, they have, don't have a lot of meat, not much uh, chicken. It's a, pretty much against the law to eat um, beef because they save that for tourism. And, and then there's a lot of other things they don't have, like soap. It's hard to get soap, hard to get detergents to wash their clothes. Um, medicines are hard, so I have a lot of friends. I mean, the, the difficult life that they lead and then just the lack of medicines and nutrition causes a lot of them to be unhealthy, and then they can't get medicine. So a lot of them are writing and telling us about this. But on the, po the other side of the coin, the other part of the city is that the church is growing there. And it's one of the churches that we're involved in and all of them combined. Like last year, they shared the gospel with more than 23,000 people and 12,000, almost 13 came to Christ. So the church is growing and so, a lot of it's through house churches, through, through smaller churches or there are some that are bigger, but it's, um, it's exciting to see what God's doing there, but at the same time, it's also painful. I mean, a lot of people are leaving Cuba right now once they open the borders in November because of the, you know, once they lifted the restrictions because of COVID. So a lot of them are leaving because it's just so hard to live there. And um, so it's, it's, it hurts us, hurts our hearts to see what these beautiful people are going through. Don and I have been raising funds and sending aid to them. We just felt a real burden to do that. Some of you have helped with that, and that's something we, we continue to do. So, so that's a little bit of an up, update of our ministry, and um, I'll sh I'll sh there's a few stories I'm going to share in the sermon as well. Um, why don't we pray? I know we've already prayed a bit, but uh, I always like to pray. <laughs> Dear Jesus, thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much for your tender mercies, Father. Thank you that we can come before you today. We recognize that we need you. We need your spirit, Lord, to work in each of our hearts, to touch each of us where in, in our need, Lord, in our place of need to minister to us, to speak to us, Lord, to make this sermon and your word come alive to us, Lord. And we just pray that you would be glorified and that you would be lifted up during this time. In your holy name we do pray. Amen. So I've titled my sermon today, Desperate for Jesus, the Sovereign Lord. And as I was sharing about Cuba, um, and Don and I have, you know, I guess it's been about six years since we first started ministering in Cuba, and they just really have, they're lovely people, have a way of endearing themselves to you. We've come to love them. A lot of them call us, I mean, it's a little more common in Latin culture, but madre and padre or mom, papa and mama, things like that. So we have a very tender and close relationship with them. And one of the things that's impressed us about them 
is just their faith and their sacrifice. And I, we see them praying in ways I've never seen Christians pray before. And some of the services I've been to, um, they have cement floors, and they'll get down on their knees, and they'll be praying together on the cement floor. And um, even older people, you'll see them praying on their knees, and, and they're always having these nights of prayers. They call them vigilias de prayer, where they um, start late at night and go through the night. They're often calling time to fast, some of, the, some of the churches will once a week, at least they'll fast like half the day. So they get together, maybe they start at 5, 6 in the morning, 7 in the morning, and then they go till noon or 1, and they're fasting during that time. And uh, it's, been, it's something that's left an impact on Don and me and made us think about the power of prayer, our need to prayer, pray and grow in prayer. And in this passage today that we're going to look at in Acts 4, we see, I'm going to give some background, but I'll read the passage first. We see it's a, it's a prayer. Basically, it's a prayer. It's after Peter and John had been persecuted, brought before the leaders. And so then they pray. And that's what this is. And we're going to look at that. We're going to look at their prayer and the boldness of their prayer here. So we'll start out. I'm going to just read this from Acts 4, starting in verse 23, and this is their prayer. It's, and so Peter and John had just been released, it says. When they were released, they went to their friends and they reported what the chief priest and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of of our father David, your servant, and said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So we see here that they lifted up their voices and they prayed. They prayed together. They prayed in unison. And there's power in prayer, there's power when we pray by ourselves, but even more so when we come together and we're praying in unison and lifting our voices to the Lord. And they, and they recognize that God is sovereign, which you know is a theological term, and Presbyterians like to use it, other groups like to use it a lot. You know, basically that God is in control. I mean, they recognize He's the, he's the creator. He's the creator of all things. And so they recognize this, they recognize his sovereignty, but they weren't passive. And, and I think that's a, a key thing because a lot of times I think when we think about sovereignty, we kind of think God just does it all and there's a danger of laying back and not feeling like we have much responsibility or we do anything or even not understanding how God does use our prayers. And so I want to address that some today, address the importance of being of how God uses our prayers. And even though God's sovereign and in control and he holds all things into his hand, it doesn't mean that we as Christians are sovereign or are, are, are are, passive. And we see that in the in the early church. You know, they were very active. They were very involved. They didn't they didn't just sit back. And so I would like to look at that and look at how the, the gospel going forth. So first, 
the context of this, of what's going on here, is Peter and John were preaching and they were sharing and they met this lame guy. It says he was lame from his whole, from his birth. And he was about 40 years old when he got healed. So, so that's what happened. And then when they get brought, so then the elders don't like it. They don't like what he's, what happened. They don't like that they're preaching about Jesus because they don't believe that Jesus was the Christ. They rejected Jesus. And um, so they bring him before there, before them. And then Peter and John say, is it because of a good deed <laughs> that we did to this lame man, which seems crazy, although we see these type of things going on in our day to day. I mean, we, you can do something good for somebody and people will think you're, you're, you're evil or you're doing the wrong thing. And, you know, they told them basically what they said is they said, stop preaching, stop doing, stop speaking in the name of Christ. And they, they basically said, whether that's right or wrong, you can decide, but we cannot stop preaching the name of Jesus Christ. There is salvation in no one else but through Christ. And that's such a powerful message right there. So they were, you know, they were standing. I mean, their, their lives were in danger and they were, they did not shrink back. I mean, that's one place we could see they were not passive. They boldly proclaim, they pr were praying for boldness and they were boldly speaking about who Jesus was and God protected them. Um, and as they were doing that, I mean, one thing I find interesting that I love about this, and it's good for me to remember as a minister, I, th I think it's good for all of us, is it says that they recognized that they were simple men. You know, they were men that hadn't studied. They hadn't gone to seminary or whatever. <laughs> whatever people did in that day, they hadn't done that. But they had been with Jesus. You know, it says that. They recognized that they were simple men they hadn't studied, they hadn't gone to the schools of that day, but they had been with Jesus. And, and I, I just think for myself as a minister that I p would hope that people would think that of me. I mean, I have studied a lot, but, but I would rather that people recognize that I've been with Jesus and that I, I spend time with Christ. And I think for all of us, that's really the key. You know, he's the one that changes us. He's the one that, you know, it talks about having a renewed mind. That's through the word. It's through being with Jesus. It's through spending time with him. Christ is the one as we're with him. And, and he enjoys that. It's those, it's those moments that nobody sees. It's like, you know, we do see in the world today, uh, ministers, some big name ministers that fall, some that aren't so big name that fall in different ways. And there's always that danger. But the secret is being with Jesus and, and guarding. I mean, we are in a war like you read about. You know, the enemy's always prowling like a lion, seeking who he may devour. We have to recognize that. And even, even the most gifted person could fall. And it doesn't mean that their ministry wasn't necessarily a strong ministry. It just sometimes means they went the wrong way or what have you there's that danger you know that we all we all face but we need to be with Jesus we need to recognize the importance of spending time with Jesus you know reading our Bible in the morning when nobody else is there those little things that we do when we're not in public are so important praying together I mean my wife and I we, I cannot say that we do it as well as I would like, but we try to pray together every day and in the more often in the morning. Um, one thing we, we do is um, sometimes when we're driving, like even this morning, we didn't really have time. We were, I guess, didn't organize our time well enough or whatever, but we didn't pray before we left the house, but we prayed in the car. And uh, so I think just taking advantage of the time and praying, doing those things when nobody's watching, that's the, the secret life is so important. And we see these guys, they were preaching and preaching boldly. And 
And we have to remember that it wasn't long ago that Peter was denying Christ. I mean, something changed. <laughs> something changed dramatically in Peter. And, you know, I mean, Pentecost happened. You know, they were filled with the Spirit. It talks here about being filled with the Spirit again. And so God living in them and giving them the strength and the power. And he, Peter experienced the power of forgiveness. That we, all of us, if we've given our life to Christ, you know, we experience that, which is, which is important for us. So in, in verse 23, first we see the boldness of their prayers to the sovereign Lord. We see how they prayed. I, I love how they used um, Psalm 2. That was part of the reason we read that this morning. But they're praying scripture. So they're using scripture to pray. And that's something that Don and I have started doing the last several years. Is we have a booklet that has um, these verses that, we've, that are really helpful. And we love to pray the scriptures. And it helps us to um, learn the Bible better. And we, we always feel greater peace when we're doing that. And we see here that they were praying Psalm 2. And, you know, they're recognizing that passage. There's kind of a fulfillment of prophecy, but something that was even going on in David's day when he um, wrote the psalm, that the nations rage. Why do the nations rage? Why do they plot against God's people is basically what Psalm 2 is saying. And we see that in our day, I think, you know, more than we have in a while. I mean, it's, it's, it's increasing. But we see the evil in our nation and in our state and even in our cities and in a, in a lot of our governments, not saying that everything in it is evil, but there's a lot of evil and a lot of it's unashamed and unabashed coming after the church and the things that the church stands for. You know, there, there's the fight for life going on right now with abortion and what's going on and even all the underhanded stuff like the leak so that it will not get overturned. We see this, this raging, this plotting, this fighting going on. There's a fight over gender issues, which relates to the fight for the family. So we see that going on, that increasing in our nation. There's a fight for integrity of the elections, which relates to a fight for freedom, that we can enjoy our God-given freedoms in this country. And we've seen over the last couple years um, a fight for faith and the freedom to worship as we've been told that the church is not essential you know the the liquor stores are essential the strip bars are essential but the church is not essential and even though the bible tells us not to forsake gathering together we're told not to gather together and worship i mean recently don and i were listening to somebody that we respect and he said during the beginning of the pandemic, and he just felt this need to, to see about gathering people together, and they did this on the Golden Gate Bridge. He sent out a tweet or something and asked people to come together to pray. So they did. He said about 400 people came, and um, there's, the police are on the Golden Gate Bridge, and they're, um, they have bicycles. And they asked, they came up to him and they asked him what they're doing. And they told him, well, we're here to pray, pray for our nation and worship. And he said that the police started crying because they said there's so many people that are jumping, you know, trying to kill themselves. And, um, you know, because of all that's going on in the country. I mean, there's a lot of people didn't talk a lot about that, but there's a lot of depression, a lot of mental health stuff that went on these last few um, times and the church is is essential for helping people i mean not just depress people but it does help give us hope the gospel is the gospel of hope and you know the list goes on i mean we could talk i could take up the next hour talking about about these things but one of it in this passage you know they start off with the first two verses of psalm 2 but then it says, if you read the whole passage, it says that he who sits in the heavens laughs. 
You know, and I, I, I love that because we see that why, why does God laugh? Because he's the creator of the universe and he will thwart the plans of the wicked. And I think we have to keep that in mind. I think there is a tendency for us, especially if you're watching mainstream media, which I would not recommend, there, there, there's a tendency to start fearing what, what's going on and that it's so overpowering and we're, we don't have any control. And, but, that's, but God sits in heaven and he laughs. He's, he's, their plans will not be successful. And I think we can, we can guarantee that. We can guarantee. I mean, I'm not saying we're not living in difficult times and it's not, been, and it's not easy to go through this stuff. It is, it is hard to go through that. But I do believe God will thwart the plans of the evil. He's going to protect his people. He's going to protect his church. And that's exactly what they prayed for here. They prayed, God, look at what they're doing. They're threatening us. Look at what they're doing. We protect us. You know, he, they even refer to um, predestination, you know, what your hand had predestined. So Presbyterians like that part. So <laughs> anyway, um, and we see the church coming together and praying in unity. And, and like I mentioned before, um, there's a lot more power in prayer than we realize. And sometimes we might say in passing, uh, you know, I'm going to pray for you, what have you, and we don't often do it. But I think if we realized the power of prayer, you know, we would do it more frequently. And a lot of it has to do with, I guess, you know, for those of you and all of us to some degree, I know, can grow in prayer and maybe we struggle with it. But instead of seeing it as a duty, like, oh, this is something I got to do today and get through today, to think about it as a relationship. You know, being with your father who loves you. He's a good, good father. He loves you. To think about it in that way, then it's a real joy to pray. And I know, I know that God loves to be with me. You know, just as he was with Adam in the cool of the day, he loves to walk with us. I mean, I do pray walking my dogs. I feel like that's some of the best times that I have with the Lord is when I'm out walking with my little dog, Daisy. One of the, one of the things that I feel like the Lord um, did recently to in, just encourage me a lot regarding prayer is I something was going on in our family. I won't tell all the details because of uh, I don't think it would be appropriate to do so. But anyway, something was going on in our family, and I was praying with Dawn for our kids, and um, I, I remember in the morning saying, oh, Lord, I just wish, and this was on a Saturday morning, and then I cut the lawn after I, we prayed. I said, I just wish I could do more than encourage them and pray for them. I just feel like, gosh, I wish I could do more. And so I was uh, mowing the lawn, which I do often on Saturdays when I'm at home. It's my time of prayer and gardening. I'm the gardener there. And so I was doing that, and I was listening to a talk. And in the talk, the, the person that was sharing talked about prayer and the power of prayer and praying for our family. And I just felt like the Lord was in speaking to me through that. He was encouraging me and saying to me, and I felt this very strongly. I actually started having tears in my eyes. I mean, I was by myself, but because I just sensed God's spirit and he was saying to me, your prayers are more powerful than you realize. And I think that a lot of times we do feel like it's futile, you know, when we're praying or, or we talk about it as a last hope, you know, like they, in sports, they use that, you know, he, what's the term? He doesn't have a hope in a prayer or something like that. So, but it's more than that. God And God moves through prayer. That's the way he's ordained things. We're gonna, we'll talk more about that as well. We see, and, and then, I mean, that was just prayer. I mean, I guess Dawn and I were praying together. I did, and I did send out some texts to friends of mine to ask them to pray as well for my family. But when we pray in unison, I think there's even greater effect. And that's what they were doing here. They lifted up their hearts in unison. 
And in Revelation 8, 3 and 4, we won't look at that, but it talks about the incense, the incense rising to God, the incense of the prayer of the saints. And that's pleasing to God. Our prayers are pleasing. It's a pleasing aroma to God. You know, in the Old Testament, they did the sacrifices and there was the aroma that pleased God. And it refers to our prayers in that way. <clears throat> wrote gets a little dry so I'd like to look at desperate prayer for boldness and healing so there are two things basically that they prayed for here and they did it out of a sense of desperation knowing that God would hear them and the two main petitions are first for boldness they pray for boldness they say as I mentioned earlier look they're threatening us God we need boldness. We need boldness to stand against that and to and faithfully proclaim the gospel. When I read that at first, I thought, well, they seem bold to me because here Peter and John just had been before the, the leaders and they stood boldly before him and they said what they did, you know, that we can't stop preaching. I mean, that was pretty bold. But then I realized, well, I guess there's the rest of the church, you know. Everybody else saw that and then it's like, wow, is that going to happen to us? You know, are we going to be able to stand when we're brought before the leaders and they say, you can't do this? You know, I mean, they, they could potentially lose their lives. And so that's why they prayed for boldness. They prayed that we would be able, they would be able to um, preach and share the good news with boldness. And, you know, I think of um, my wife, <laughs> she loves to share her faith and she does it you know, better than I do in a lot of ways, and, and she's very bold. And just the other day, we went to, I told her, I need to go to the bulldog shop and refresh my wardrobe a little bit. So we went over there, and um, there were a couple of women there. And um, Dawn has kind of a winsome way of sharing. So she told one of the ladies that she looked really pretty because she was dressed nicely. And that just led into a conversation, and she was able to encourage them. And a lot of times, for, for Dawn, uh, she does this probably more than I do, but she'll ask them a question. She'll say, our daughter, who, who is 22 years old, moved to the most amazing place that you could imagine. And then ask them, where do you think that would be? And they start trying to guess, you know, Hawaii or whatever. Uh, it's interesting to hear the places they guess. And then she says, no, they mo she moved to heaven. And then uh, she'll bridge that into saying, um, well, do you ever, th do you think much about heaven? And it gives her an opportunity to share. And most, it was interesting with these two women, because one of them was probably in her 50s, and the other was uh, maybe a student. She was like 20 years old, but they were both smiling. I mean, I could tell they both enjoyed what she was sharing. But I think it's, um, it's I mean, I, I must admit, I'm not as extroverted as my wife, so it's a little harder for me maybe to launch out. But we all need boldness. I mean, even, I mean, in this country, even though there is a lot of opposition nowadays, and we do have a lot of freedoms, and we have, to, you know, the Bible talks about the sower and the seed. We, we sow the seed. I mean, it, I think farmers here know if you don't, if you don't plant, you're not going to have a, fr a crop. You're not going to uh, have any fruit. And it's the same with the gospel. And, and that's another thing of not being passive, that we have to be active. With, my, with the church planners I work with, I tell them, I tell them this over and over because sometimes I feel like they focus too much on just studying the Bible and do these things which are important. But if you're going to start a church, you've got to be out there sowing the seed. You have to share the good news of Jesus so that people will come to Christ. Um, and, you know, the Bible talks about discerning the times, understanding the times that we're living in. And, and as we mentioned earlier, we do have an enemy who wars against us. And Ezekiel speaks of standing in the gap, building the wall, standing in the gap. And that's something that the Lord calls us to. And then some of David's mighty men, you know, it talks about his mighty men. I love that, maybe partly because my name's David also. 
but I love how it talks about David's mighty men. And some of those mighty men are Issachar, the men of Issachar. It says they understood the times. And I think we need to understand the times that we're living in, you know, and realize what's going on and how we can pray, how we can be active, that we're not, we're not just um, helpless bystanders. We're very much involved in the church needs to gather together and to pray. I believe that we want, one of the things that I've seen as we've ministered is how God responds to desperate people. So the first, the first part of the prayer was for boldness. And then the second part was for signs, for, for signs and wonders, it says in the passage. And then the place was shaken. And um, and I like the story of Bartimaeus. You know, here's the blind beggar. He's been blind for a long time. And he's sitting there on the side of the road, and he's screaming out to Jesus. I mean, it, if you can imagine that, being in somewhere in a town square or something, downtown in a mall, and somebody starts yelling out for another person, and everybody around him, and these are small towns, so I'm sure they knew this guy, and they tell him basically to shut up, like in, uh, you know, be quiet, shut up. I mean, in Spanish, it says callate, which means, you know, be quiet, shut up. And so they're telling him to be quiet, but he, it says he actually started screaming louder, which, which shows that he was desperate. He, he wanted Jesus' attention. And, and I do believe there's a principle there that sometimes when we scream out for Christ, when we really need him, that some people, even religious people, are going to discourage us from doing so because they get embarrassed by it. But this guy had so much shame. I mean, he had lived in shame for so long, and he was desperate for Christ. And I, I do think we need to get to that place of desperation for Jesus, crying out to Jesus. And then Jesus didn't, didn't say, uh, why, why are you doing that? You know, be quiet. He, didn't, he, didn't, he wasn't in kind like, like the crowd. He asked, what do you want? What do you want me to do for you? Which seems like an interesting question since he's Christ and knows all things and, and all. But, and, uh, you know, Jesus responded to him. And brought and healed him. And then there's another story of the woman that was bleeding, the woman that was hemorrhaging. And you think about that, you know, in that day, if you were bleeding, you're unclean. That means you couldn't worship, she couldn't go to the temple. And um, she wasn't, you're not supposed to touch men in that culture. So she broke all these taboos and she touched his cloak. And God healed her through that. And, um, and Jesus responded in, in mercy and compassion. He did not rebuke her. He did not rebuke either one of them for kind of breaking the taboos of the day. Both of them were, she had, it says that she had spent all her money going to the doctor, going to uh, different med medical remedies, you know, which of course it's not bad to go to, we need doctors and all, that's not the point, but but she, had re she exhausted all her resources, in other words, trying to look for a remedy. And Jesus had compassion on her, and he didn't rebuke her. He said to her, um, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. That's what he told her. <laughs> I mean, that's a great response, and I, I do think that Jesus wants us to come to him in that way. And... You know, we struggle a lot of times, maybe because of our relationship with our own da earthly dad or, or what have you, relationship with different things, with seeing Christ and seeing God the Father as a loving Father who loves his children and wants good things for us. So, so, so I think that's just so important as, as for you. As, you know, how, do you, how do you see Jesus? Jesus asked Bartimaeus what he wanted him to do for him. And how would you respond to that question? 
you know, if Jesus were, was to ask you today, what do you want Jesus to do for you? I think that might be a good thing to consider. There's a book I've been reading. It's called uh, Miracles Today by Greg Kinnear. And it's pr probably one of the best books I've read in a number of years. And this, the author of this book, this book's only about 280 pages, but he's studied miracles around the world. And um, he, his larger, vo larger volume, or I think it's two volumes, has it's 1,000 pages of all the miracles. And these are things that, there are eyewitnesses, there are doctors that um, verified, you know, these these miracles, and um, and in the book he says that um, one author that I knew when I went to seminary, his name's J. P. Moreland. He's a professor at Biola. I don't know if he's still teaching there or not. He may have retired by now, but he reports that 70% of rapid evangelism around the world or rapid evangelical growth around the world is due to signs, to divine acts that people's attention, uh, that kind of get people's attention, get for the message of the gospel, that the Lord does work through. So they were recognizing that, they're recognizing the importance of boldly preaching the gospel, but also that God would show up and do things that they couldn't do. I mean, a miracle is something that, that we can't do. And in, in this book, one of the, I mean, there's all kinds of stories, and some of them, as I read them, I just started crying, you know, tears are coming to my eyes because they're just such amazing stories. And one of them was about a woman named Delia Knox, and she lives, I, th I think, in Buffalo, somewhere in northern United States, and she was involved in a horrible car crash, and she was, um, will in a wheelchair for 22 years. She was paralyzed for 22 years. And um, a lot of people did pray for her and did pray that she would get better and that she would be healed. But it said, she said after 10 years, she began to lose hope. And she actually came to, I guess, every once in a while where she was going to church or maybe in different places, they would have healing services and she would go to those and she began to dread them. But then one night, she, she, she worshipped in the, uh, she was in the choir, so she sang. So I think that's part of the reason she was at some of these different services. And people knew her because of that, because she, um, she was singing in the worship band or the choir. And one night, there was an evangelist there, and he prayed for her, and she began to get feeling in her legs. And then with the help of her husband and her friends, she was able to, stand up and walk. And it took her a little while to get used to because she hadn't walked for so long for her muscles to get strong and her feet hadn't been used to sustaining her weight. So it took a little bit of time for that to happen. But, you know, we see, and I mean, that's just one example, like I said, of many in this book, Miracles Today. I would highly encourage it. And, um, but you know, they, pray, they prayed that way. They prayed, God, um, we need boldness. We need boldness to preach. And then that you would stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of Jesus. And then that the place shook, you know, as they did that. And so I feel... I don't know, one of the things I want to emphasize is I just, I think that we don't always understand the power of prayer. We talk about it a lot, but we struggle to really believe it and understand. In Ephesians 2, 6, it says that we are seated in the heavenly places, and there's passages in the New Testament where Christ says that he gives us authority, that in uh, the Great Commission, you know, he talks about all authority has been given to to me and I send out to you and and then we see other passages in the Bible these things I feel they're they're not like easy to understand in the one hand because we have these two tensions that are going on but the Bible says you have not because you ask not so that means somehow some way even though God's sovereign and in control 
that if you are not asking for something, you're not receiving it. it. It our prayer. I mean, that means our prayers do change things. And Jesus Himself said, "Ask, and you will receive." In Matthew seven, you know, Matt, He's teaching about prayer there. He te- that's where we get the Our Father prayer from in Matthew seven. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. So. That means that God does hear our prayers and he acts upon them. And so I just, I want to encourage each of you today, just, you know, no matter who you are, God hears your prayers and they're much more powerful than you realize. They can change the world in many ways. And we see here that the whole earth shook. Hebrews 4 says, that we come to God boldly, we come to the throne boldly. You know, because of Christ, the, the, the veil was torn from top to bottom, and we have access now to the Holy of Holies, where before, you know, the priest would only go once a year. They tied something to his, a rope to his leg in case he did something wrong. They had to drag him out. And now we have access. We have access to, to the throne and the earth shook. God showed up. God wants a relationship with you. It's, a lot of it is about the relationship, about the love relationship that he has. Just like Mary, it says Mary chose the better thing when Martha and Mary came to Christ. And Mar- Martha was in the kitchen making potato salad or something. And uh, she was complaining about Mary. And Jesus said that Mary had chosen the better thing, which teaches us something. I think one thing as well, and and I'll try to close with this since we're going to do the Lord's Supper, is as we're praying to look for sparks. That's one of the things I've started doing, like in some some way, like uh, signs that God is hearing and he's acting on the things we're praying for. Um, so I have a friend of mine, and he encouraged me. To, he said, revival is coming to the Presbyterians, and I like that. And, it, you know, in Mexico, I work with the Presbyterian Church, and, and sometimes it can be discouraging. We don't always see what we'd like to see. Sometimes there's opposition. There's things that we don't like. And um, so I, I felt like, I like that. I want to pray about that. I want to pray that revival will come to the Presbyterians. And I've started doing that and kind of contending for that and just looking for the little, little things that God's doing. So we have a church in Mexicali, a different one than the one I mentioned. And I took uh, some pastors to Guadalajara to learn more about church planning, learn a good church planning model. And um, one of the guys, his name's Federico, he came back and the pastor there told them, you know, if your church isn't growing, something's wrong, it's sick, something. And so he came back and he realized that he was, um, he needed to do something different. And they were meeting in a location and they were renting it and they were struggling to pay for the rent. And they just felt like they needed to start to meet in another place. And they did that, and they like doubled their uh, how many people were coming. And pe- people started coming to Christ now. So they were real small. They were around 20, and then they went to 40, and over 40. And so just that small adjustment, and that's like kind of what I'm talking about, is look for the sparks. And then we have another church plant in Oaxaca, which is south of Mexico City. So we do work throughout Mexico. And the church planters there are very gifted. And on um, Easter, so they started growing. They just, they weren't able to meet the restrictions in Mexico. I've even been tighter than here. So they started meeting in September. And the church started growing. And on Easter Sunday, they had 110 people come to their service, you know. And then since then, they've been coming around 90 and so I just thought, you know, instead of looking, I, I, the danger is, is w- what happens, and I think the enemy does, I think Rick mentioned this, try to discourage us, 
is if we're just looking at the bad things going on, that can really suck us down. It can pull us down. But if we look at, see, God is always doing, he's always at work and he's doing good things, but we have to, we have to notice them. Sometimes they're little things. Sometimes they're big, you know, like these miracles in the Bible. That, that's a big thing. Or like this lady that got healed, <laughs> you know, uh, that was in a wheelchair. That's a big thing. But sometimes it's little little things that God's doing and to notice it and to realize it takes a spark to get a fire going. You know, God works through sparks. Um, George Mueller, have, maybe some of you have heard of him. He, was, he had an orphanage in, in England, and I don't know how many orphans, but a lot of orphans were helped through him. And he, had, he was just known for praying and trusting God. And he said that he didn't want to ask anybody for the needs that they had. He just wanted to pray. I mean, I think he published these, uh, what God was doing in a, in a newsletter, or maybe in the paper back in those days. And, um, but he said, they said, I read something recently that said when he died, that they have documented 50,000 answered prayers, <laughs> you know, because he was writing these down. And, um, but f only 5,000 of those were answered on the same day. And so that means like 90% of them, you know, he had to keep praying, keep contending for. And, and that, that's, an, you know, God doesn't always answer immediately our prayers. And one thing that George Mueller said is he said, don't let the prayers that apparently weren't answered yesterday to keep you from praying today. And I do think that when we think about warfare, I mean, there, there, Don and I have seen some things that are, you know, out there where people are possessed and different things. But a lot of it is more subtle. A lot of it is through discouragement and things that we don't maybe always recognize it as um, warfare. But the enemy is subtle as well in the way he works. And he'll do whatever he can, however he can, to pull us down, to make us ineffective. And so we have to pray. It says stand in that passage in Ephesians 6 that we read earlier. It says stand against the powers and principalities. It says our battle is not against flesh and blood. So when we see what's going on in the world, that's another reason why, the, why God laughs, why God sits. It's not really against all these people that are evil in a lot of ways. It's the evil behind. It's the enemy behind that's doing these things and just recognizing God is in control. We can trust him. He loves us. We can come boldly and expectantly to the throne. Let us pray. <laughs> Dear Jesus, thank you so much for loving us and caring for us and hearing our prayers, Lord. And I do pray for everybody here. We all have needs, Lord. And you do come to us. And I think you ask us that question that you asked Bartimaeus. What do you want me to do for you? And I, I pray, Lord, that we would, we would ask you to do, to show up and to respond to the needs that we have, whether it be for our family members, whether it be for our physical health, Lord, whether it be for a job, for your provision, Lord, whatever, whatever we need we have, that you will respond, Lord, even, even for these miraculous things that you would do of, of bringing healing, Father, that, you're, you're, that you would work in ways that even beyond what we can ask or think. We just thank you, Father. We thank you. And we just pray even for this church as the church is kind of at a critical time. We pray that you would direct them, Father, that you would make it very clear to them the way to go, the way to move forward, the way to see the church growing, Father, what they need to adjust, what they need to do differently, Father. We just pray that you would make that very clear to them as well, the leadership here, and that they would rise up together in unison and, and pray. Thank you, Lord. In your holy name we do pray. Amen.